Greetings, everyone. Thank you for tuning in tonight. And thank you for your patience as we got started with the tech. Um, this event is called Mobilizing Sovereign Movements, Native Treaties, Artistic Interventions, and Electoral Power. Um, this is the second dialogue in the larger series. The first dialogue was on Friday, um, and we had some uh, great panelists um, that I'll be talking about in a minute. And then our uh, third and final dialogue will be occurring uh, post-election on Saturday. Um, so I just wanted to welcome you. Again, the event is called Mobilizing Sovereign Movements, Native Treaties, Artistic Interventions, and Electoral Power. Um, as mentioned, tonight is our second pre-election dialogue in the series. We'll be having another final third dialogue post-election this Saturday, November 7th, um, 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern, which is also 1 to 3 p.m. Central. Um, those who are watching tonight, we encourage you to let friends and loved ones, family members, and beloved communities know about tonight's dialogue and the larger series. The dialogue will be going on for the next two hours, and we encourage additional audience members. Uh, we have found that the more people are encouraged to engage the election by those close to them, the greater chance of getting out the vote mobilization. We encourage everyone who is eligible to vote in this election to vote tomorrow, November 3rd, Election Day. Again, welcome. I will start off by reading the dot description for the series. Mobilizing sovereign movements, native treaties, artistic interventions, and electoral power is a diverse dialogue series with indigenous womanist and two-spirit queer, trans, indigenous leaders in Oklahoma and New York and across Turtle Island in the Pacific, engaging each other and our communities about intersections of native sovereignty, gender, sexuality, the arts, and mobilizing electoral politics. Occurring over three distinct interlinked dialogues, the series is co-sponsored by the American Indian Community House in New York and Tulsa Artist Fellowship in Oklahoma. The series examines ongoing challenges faced by tribal nations and native peoples in the wake of the McGirt v. Oklahoma decision and interwoven legal issues, such as the ongoing renewal of the intersectional provisions of the Violence Against Women Act, the Indian Child Welfare Act, American Indian Religious Freedom Act, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and Voting Rights Act, as well as the 2020 US Census and election as they affect issues of sovereignty, violence, gender, sexuality, civil liberties, freedom of expression and assembly, representation, and human rights. The dialogue participants are indigenous womanists and two-spirit slash queer slash trans indigenous leaders in the arts, education, law, health, media, and environmental and social justice organizing. Gather with us to discuss how best to mobilize and creatively impact the election, these issues, and the future of our communities. My name is Ahim Sotomoteo Baron, and I'm the organizer and moderator of the series. This project was created with support by Tulsa Artist Fellowship and the American Indian Community House. Created by the George Kaiser Family Foundation, Tulsa Artist Fellowship supports both local and national artists while enriching the Tulsa community. The American Indian Community House, AICH, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization serving the needs of Native Americans residing in New York City. AICH was founded in 1969 by Native American volunteers as a community-based organization mandated to improve the status of Native Americans and to foster intercultural understanding. Next, I'll be reading the Tulsa Artist Fellowship Land Acknowledgement. I am a Tulsa Artist Fellow and live here in Tulsa. Um, and here in Tulsa, the Tulsa Artist Fellowship begins each event with the reading of this land acknowledgement. So let me just have that ready in the PDF. So this is the Tulsa Artist Fellowship Land Acknowledgement. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contribute their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life. Some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted, and some fled Tulsa never to return. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We are standing on the tribal lands of the Osage, Cherokee, and Muscogee Creek people. We honor their elders past and present. We are standing on the land of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. We pay respect to these victims and survivors, past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement upon this land. Tulsa Artist Fellowship offers our care and commitment to acknowledging these truths 
and resisting injustice in all forms through intentional programming and artistic practices. Um, last Friday, we started off with a powerful first dialogue. Our panelists were Lydia Cheshawala, who's Osage, Cherokee, Dakota, Modoc, and Chicana, an artist, organizer, and consultant. We also had Tara Moses, who's Tusekia Harjo Band of Seminole Nation, as well as Muskoki. And Tara is a playwright, director, arts producer, and advocate. We also had Molly Murphy Adams, who's of Aglala Lakota descent. And Molly is a visual artist, art appraiser, and all around maker of things. And then we also had Aubrey Zodeen Aken um, Skeeter, uh, who is Yuchi and Muskoki, an educator and language revitalization advocate. Um, so our last dialogue, um, which was really powerful um, and went for about two and a half hours, um, is available for viewing and we have it video recorded and it's available for viewing on the American Indian community social media platforms. So you can see it here on Facebook. Um, the, the video is there. It's also available on our YouTube page and it's available in three different uh, parts in smaller chunks on our Instagram page. So if you'd like to see that dialogue, if you'd like to share it with people, um, please do. Um, and also um, this dialogue, which is being recorded, will be available either later tonight or tomorrow on those same social media platforms. So we encourage people to share these videos to help pierce that isolation and to um, hopefully have our communities feel really supported um, by the work that people are doing during this historical moment. Um, and then, try to see, I already just talked through this next paragraph, so I'm seeing if there's anything. Um, yeah, I'll read this one sentence. Uh, the topic raised um, tonight and throughout the series are relevant not only prior to tomorrow's election day, but also reflect intersectionally on pressing issues facing our communities, this historical moment, and offer reflections on how we move forward into the future. For tonight's second pre-election dialogue, we have another powerful gathering of panelists. Tonight's panelists are Ozawa Benishi Albert, who is Yuchi and Anishinaabe. Um, Benishi is an environmental and community organizer and creative maker. Um, we also have Shawi Olali, Glenda S. Dillingham, who is Chickasaw Nation. And Shawi Olali is a two-spirit writer, painter, and therapist. Um, and then we also have Jenny Keller, who is Cherokee Nation and works in indigenous curation. And then hopefully um, there might have been like some tech issues earlier. So um, hopefully like um, Jaisha Lyons will be able to, Jaisha Lyons Echohawk will be able to join us still tonight. But if not, we're gonna see that we can try and so we were into the third dialogue post-election. Um, so Jaisha Lyons Echohawk is Seminole, Pawnee Creek, Omaha and Iowa and um, is a birth worker, a student midwife, a 2S birth worker, um, a student midwife, activist, and community builder. So um, I've known Jaisha um, actually more um, through some of her relatives and um, who um, one of her relatives, I definitely knew quite well in the St. Louis area. Um, and so um, since coming to Tulsa two years ago, I've been really impressed with um, the work that I've seen Jaisha been doing since way before I was ever here um, in a variety of platforms in terms of various intersectional issues affecting our communities um, and definitely in terms of political engagement across a variety of platforms and issues. Um, I know that since I am new to Tulsa, I wanted to ask someone who is definitely not new to Oklahoma to maybe speak about Chesha a little bit more. So I asked um, Benishi if um, they would be willing to uh, speak a little bit about Jaisha as well to honor the work that Jaisha does in this world and that hopefully if she joins uh, us tonight or later in the series, y'all can know about this uh, powerful person. Benicia, would you like to share a little bit about Jaisha if you have a moment? I think your audio is off right now, dear. Thank you. Sure, I would love to. I have lots of great things to say about her, but she also just joined us, so. <laughs> great, I didn't see that, okay. Yeah, no, you gave her a glowing introduction and she she was smiling. I'm sorry, I had it as a row of columns, so I only had four, so I didn't have it in the full uh, gallery view. So I'm so sorry, Jason, that here I'm like talking as if you're not there. I'm so sorry, everyone in the audience too, because I just had the top, there's different views on Zoom. Oh, I thought now this I'm was like a mirror. <laughs> yeah, like I'm a vampire, you can't see me. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So kind, yeah, I just had you, you. seat across the top, I didn't. <laughs> 
Well, welcome. Hello, Jaysha. It's so good to see you. Um, would you like to introduce yourself maybe for a second since I was trying to honor you, but also wasn't <laughs> sure if you were coming. So yeah, please. <laughs> Uh, sure, no worries. No akitade tata sati tata chik stariku. Jaisha Lauren Zakoha, Jaho Jaskados. Yes, I'm, my name is Jaisha. I am Jay and Marsha's kid, so that's how you get a Jaisha. Um, you said a lot, <laughs> so I don't want to take too much up, but yeah, I'm a two spirit birth worker, um, Seminole Creek, Pawnee, Omaha, and Iowa, based in Pawnee jurisdiction, and uh, mother of four. Um, I, yeah, you've said more, um, or enough, and I can elaborate later. I don't want to take time from whoever else you were introducing, so appreciate it so much. Thank you so much, and again, sorry for that. Like, sometimes, like I said, like, you just see a few boxes, and not all of them, but now I can see all of you, which is even more transformative and amazing to have you all here, so yay. Um, yeah, and there will be time for each person to talk more about themselves and the work they do in this world. Um, so tonight's format, um, we'll begin with some questions for the panelists and we'll flow organically from there. And we're also going to be, since this is really a loving, very informal dialogue, even if we're talking about important issues, the panelists are also going to be co-creating this dialogue. So they've had these questions, I sent them to them earlier, but I also was very clear, like, this is your dialogue. Where do you want to go? What do you want to talk about? What's important to you? How can we have you and your brilliance and your experiences centered. So they're also going to be, um, you're not going to see this, but they might be like texting me in the Zoom chat to let me know like, hey, can we also talk about this or that? So in addition to any questions I have, we're just going to have an organic flow. And that's what we did on the first night. And it was really powerful. So if everyone's ready, I think I'm going to start with opening up with the first question. Um, so the first question is, um, could you introduce yourself and talk a bit about the work you do in the world? Um, after doing that, could you talk a bit about how your work has shifted this year? It's been a really challenging year. We've been dealing with so many intersecting challenges, the coronavirus pandemic, ongoing and intensification of violent oppression, harassment and targeting of the communities of which we are part, um, the environmental crisis in terms of climate change and the ongoing political electoral crisis. And that's only a few of the things. What do you do in the world? And how has that shifted this past year? And we can do it sort of organically, whoever wants to speak, and then the next person can go. Thank you. I guess I'll go. Fase, Benishi, Zetie, Zoyaha, Kandu, Anishinabe, Zesho, Dasen. We woke a dochine and Ayen um Kato Kana. Um so the my my um my name is Benishi Albert, um Ozawa Benishi Albert and um uh Yuchi and Anishinaabe and um I make my home in Wewoka, Oklahoma, although my my folks are from Gypsy <laughs> south of Bristol. And um I, um, you know, in the daytime, I work for an organization called the Indigenous Environmental Network. Um, but, um, you know, this is my home community, Oklahoma, and and uh, most of Uchi people are from just, just around south of Tulsa anyway. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, in my work um, with the Indigenous Environmental Network, you know, I've been affiliated with that organization in some shape or form, was helped found it when I was a young person um, in my teens even. Um, but I have been involved in um, native rights work and um, environmental justice work for you know 30 years. It's hard to say I've done anything for 30 years. I don't feel that old. <laughs> but um, I um, th that's that's work that has been very important to me. And and there was a moment in that time of work that I was also in um, New Mexico for about 20 years. Um, and I returned home a few years back. Um, and in that time when I was in New Mexico, um, you know, it, it, it's strange to be working in a different uh, realm because when I was in New Mexico, I helped found an organization called the Native American Voters Alliance. 
um, and was very proud of, of that work of engaging Native communities in um, all levels, not just voting, but like, how do you talk to your elected officials? How do you show up at city council? How do you show up at the state legislature? How do you side in to what issues are important to you and how to talk about them? Um, and so, yeah, it's very strange in this season to like election season and I'm not door knocking or handing out flyers or getting people registered to vote. And I've been just like trying to hold down a lot of work um, around the environment. And so, you know, in this time of COVID, um, in this time of COVID, there's like um, the methodology has changed of how we're doing this work. Um, but there's no been there's no been no like work has not stopped, right? Like the issues that are important to us have not gone away because of COVID. We've had new issues added on top of that, you know, in terms of the health and well-being of communities, but the threats to indigenous lands, the threats to um, the environment and to the health and well-being of our community still exist. Um, and adding COVID to that has just, you know, intensified some of those in different ways. Um, and then also, you know, just making sure people have their needs met, um, have, you know, is how the work has changed. And I spend a lot more time in front of the screen on Zoom calls, <laughs> um, which is frustrating. Um, but I have appreciated um, having time home um, because of the nature of the work that I do tends to be national and international. I'm also not home in this area code um, most times of the year. And, you know, and so it's been nice to be home and, you know, be in my house and working with my, my, my family and, um, you know, all of that here. But good to be here with each of you. Thank you so much, Panishi. Thank you. I can go. Uh, Osio, uh, hello. My name is Jenny Keller, and um, I am very happy to be here tonight. Um, I am um, Cherokee Nation, and I currently live in Muskogee Creek Nation in Tulsa, but I grew up in Adair, which is um, in within the borders of Cherokee Nation, so around lots of family members and community. Um, and I, um, this has been a crazy year. It's, uh, it's been challenging because so much of my work is with the public directly. I work um, in museum um, curation, indigenous curation at Gilcrease in Tulsa. And it's been difficult to adjust to that because so much of it is one-on-one is -on -one kind of work. Um, so we've had to learn how to work with this digital platform and it's, um, it's been challenging for the people we work with too, because we're so used to being together physically. And there's there's like a power when you're you're together physically that just you can feel with these projects. And so it's been hard to kind of keep that momentum going. Um, but on the flip side, we can theoretically reach more people, which has been a nice kind of thing with this, these platforms that may not have been able to join otherwise. So there's pros and cons, of course, but um, yeah, it's been, um, it's been challenging and the fear, I think, navigating that fear of those few times when you do need to meet with people face to face or come in or, I mean, we're encouraging people to come into our building. And so there's always a risk and it's, it's um, yeah, it's been, it's been challenging. And then um, just for myself, I mean, I also live alone. So it's been difficult navigating that solitude as well, um, especially for like a double extrovert person like me. So it's been challenging to learn how to live with myself <laughs> and entertain myself and keep my own sanity. Um, yeah, right. So um, those few moments where you do get to get out and be with people are so meaningful and so wonderful. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know, I'm looking forward to hearing what everybody else has been going through and how they've been dealing with everything. And I'm just very happy to be a part of the group. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Whoever wants to go next.
There we go. Uh, Chokma, Sahochi Shawiolali. I am Chickasaw. Uh, my family's from Medill, Oklahoma, which is pretty much a wide spot in the road if any of you have ever driven past it. Um, right now, I am working on a military base, doing primarily sexual assault work. Um, and the nature of that job doesn't lend along with COVID doesn't lend to doing much outside of that work. However, I found that it's been a prime time to educate people on race, on sexism, on toxic masculinity and all sorts of things. Um, so I've been glad to do that. Um, also chalk bombing. You go to the college at night, that's a really good way to get your point across sometimes. So, um, and I've been doing this work for a very long time. Um, started about 25 years ago, um, shortly at, before I met Ahimsa. And I primarily work with native children um, and then a larger community um, of children, children that are abused and then back to native foster care for the majority of my life. I worked on the Navajo reservation, pretty much doing what I do now. I was hired as a sexual assault counselor um, that was funded through the VAWA Act, which I was very appreciative of. And then I came here to Yuma to try something new. And it's been very enlightening to see how the uh, war machine works, <laughs> things like that. Um, and actually met quite a few decent people, so I'm grateful for that. Working at home has been challenging. I, I'm in the office a lot more these days. And like I said, it's a really good time for people. Um, when George Floyd was killed, I had a lot of Caucasian people calling me and asking me, what do I do? I didn't know this was going on in the world. And my message to them was educate yourself and vote. And I've said that a thousand times since, educate yourself and vote. So I think a lot of people are waking up to what's, what we've all known has been going on in the country. Right. Well, thank you. I'm going to pass, pass the baton. Thank you so much. And yeah, I know each of you in different capacities. Like um, I've uh, known my dear friend here, um, Shawi Olali for, since 99, since last century, you know? Um, and so when we were both living in California doing work and um, you were in the Central Valley and I was um, in the Bay Area. And then other people I've had the blessing of knowing, and there's other people in the series who I've known even longer. Like there's one person here I've known, I don't even know how long, wait, since like 94 maybe, like I think. And um, so when I was a teenager, you know, so, um, so, so yeah, so, and then other people I've had the blessing of building with very closely over the, like the last few years here in Tulsa, such as Lydia Cheshawala, who's part of the, the series um, on the first night. And then other people I'm like, you know, like Tara Moses, someone who I adore and who I think is amazing doing stuff in the performing arts world and other areas who we've totally vibed, but we're just starting now to build with each other. So hopefully similar with like Jaysha, this is someone who I, I know people just like, like rave about and I know relatives who hold you in such high regard. And so I'm very excited to have you be part of this dialogue. And yeah, hopefully this can be one of the first things that we do together. And so I'd love to hear more about the work you do in the world and um, yeah, and how this year has like, you know, shifted for you. Mado Ahimsa, it's good to see you again. Good to see you, Binishi, and it's good to be a part of the circle. Uh, Mado, all of you for being here and um, your patience. <laughs> I'm a single caregiver right now. Um, my partner is traveling back from Phoenix, so uh, we had, uh, you know, it's life, life in Zoom. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, I... It's been really interesting to say the least. I mean, that's really a huge understatement considering what we've all been going through personally and then collectively. Um, 
the pandemic has certainly touched my community where I live. In fact, I did a grocery drop off to a family um, yesterday uh, in the middle of this election stuff I'm doing. Um, they're very close. I've coached their daughter um, in softball and I, I think maybe one year of basketball, but we, we know each other pretty well and I really feel for them. Um, definitely concerned, but it seems like they're um, dealing with it all right. So, um, you know, just it, I didn't need, you know, they didn't need to get COVID. It didn't have to be somebody I knew to know that it's very serious. It's very concerning. It's very um, like kind of at the forefront of my mind. So navigating um, like our children and their schooling, uh, it's hard to turn off my advocate hat. <laughs> and I think ultimately that's what I am. I'm a community builder and um, justice seeker. So regardless of whatever, um, issue or uh, uh, organization that um, I've been asked to work with, I um, kind of, that's my default. Um, I'm somebody who looks at the situation and wonders what's going on here and is there another way we could do this or why are we doing it in this particular way? So I find myself um, really um, advocating for my community in a variety of ways. I have recently become trained as um, a birth worker or like a birth doula, uh, which is birth support, um, labor support, uh, prenatal support, postpartum support for birthing people. Um, I'm also open to holding space for people who choose not to continue with the pregnancy. Um, I prefer to work with um, our folks, like our indigenous folks, our black and brown folks, those folks who would not otherwise have resources to get this um, really ancestral, um, you know, person in terms of the community roles. Uh, in my current community, to my knowledge, there is not anybody who is practicing like from carrying on from their family from, you know, generations ago. Um, uh, I know we're out there. I just haven't found all of us um, within this uh place that is now called Oklahoma. Um, but that's been my uh, my goal. My effort is to continue um, with this work. But uh, when um, this pandemic hit and we start seeing these gaps in, in healthcare access, um, knowing the rates of maternal mortality, knowing the rates of you know, racism in, in the system, in the medical system, and then you know the, the, the climax, as it were, in um, the middle of this year with um, our relatives, our uh, Black relatives being killed um, in these very brutal ways um, really kind of pulled me back into work one-on-one -on -one because when the pandemic first hit, I was not able to be in person, um, kind of, you know, had to shift and consider how do I do it from a distance? How do I do it remotely? Or how do we do it virtually? Um, which was really kind of difficult to navigate because this work is very um, uh, interpersonal. Like, you know, you, you really need to be um, in, in the same space. Um, and so when uh, May and June hit, um, I decided to go full in and become, um, or start my training in midwifery. Um, so I could extend um, my knowledge and further hold space um, because when you're, you know, a birth worker, just birth support, you're not really um, hands in in terms of, of being able to catch the, the babies. Um, so I uh, took that on this summer and have been, yeah, been been um, exposed <laughs> in the birth birth setting, but it's been um, worth it just to provide or hold space for um, a variety of birthing people um, who are choosing um, to deliver outside of the hospital setting due in part to the COVID restrictions. Not that they're in disbelief of COVID, but it's um, kind of a, been a difficult um, way to navigate uh, somebody's you know, process, their ceremony, that time of their life um, in this current you know, pandemic. Of course, the hospital has their restrictions for a very good reason, um, but it's very limiting. Um, I think there was some um, medical facilities that were allowing like more than one person, but there's been a lot of times where these birthing people are by themselves on their appointments, not even with their partners or whatever support person they might, you know, have had with them in, in you know, pre-pandemic. 
Um, outside of that, I've been doing um, uh, civic engagement. Um, I was doing a uh, census work, digital outreach. That was interesting to learn how to get people really jazzed up about the census in order to, you know, to be counted. Um, especially our communities that are most undercounted or most underrepresented in that count. Um, that's, you know, took over a lot of my um, year and it was interesting. And I got to learn to be a streamer, <laughs> um, learned how to do um, a lot of virtual events. So I'm unfortunately pretty comfortable in front of a computer screen now, <laughs> um, talking as though you're with me in the room. And uh, and that's transitioned into Native voter outreach. And so I'm working on the Natives Vote 2020 campaign, which is part of um, Illuminative and Native Organizers Alliance. Um, hopefully that becomes um, a sustainable work here in Oklahoma, not just for this current election, but that um, we will, you know, create um, a foundation here. And I know it's there's, you know, been many times that people have done voter engagement and there's other organizations, but you know, it's like a funding issue. It's getting um, people to commit, you know, even when there's not an election or um, not a well-known election um, to, to work on it. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful in our efforts. Um, uh, and I think that's, yeah, that's as much as I can say. I mean, I, I think maybe we touched base or I feel like we might've crossed paths whenever I was running for office like two years ago. Um, and that was definitely an interesting experience um, being that I was kind of the first for um, as young as I was uh, for being a native woman. Um, and then uh, I, I'm a Democrat running in a really deep red state in rural Oklahoma. So that was something to, uh, to contend with, to deal with and kind of motivated me to continue on with this uh, voter engagement work, so. Thank you. <laughs> well, y'all are amazing. Thank you so much, Jaisha. Um, really powerful. Um, so if everyone's okay, I'm gonna transition to the second question. And again, at any point, you can guide the dialogue where you want it to go. Um, so the second question has a lot of parts. It's like the biggie of the night. So um, I definitely let people know in advance of the panel, feel free to take on any part of it, start anywhere and respond to whatever part most resonates with you. And then from there, we can come back to different things if um, you want to, you know, different threads. So, so because I think it, some things are just so interwoven that I feel like it's, you need to talk about all of that moment, but we can also make it manageable how we, how we address things. So the second question, which is a long one, has multiple parts is, we are on the eve of a historic election some have said it may be the most important one in our lifetimes and perhaps the most important in a century or even in the U.S.'s history. Much is at stake. In addition to the U.S. presidency, the U.S. Senate has many important races. Every congressional seat in the U.S. House of Representatives is up, as are their important races with various state legislatures, governors and mayoral races, elections for state Supreme Court justices, and various territorial and tribal elections. And some of those tribal elections have been occurring throughout the year as they often do, but there are some tribal elections that are occurring tomorrow. And there are some tribal elections that are occurring in the next week. So I know that there's various things going on in different places um, and various ballot initiatives. Um, and also when I'm listing tribal elections, I'm just listing that there's multiple elections going on. I, people might totally identify them in a very sovereign way as not having anything to do with the US set of elections. And so I really wanna honor those distinctions, but also just to honor that there's simultaneous, the simultaneity of these elect, of multiple types of elections, some very different from each other going on. Um, in addition, indirectly, but pressing on everyone's mind is the future of the US Supreme Court, its impact on tribal sovereignty and its impact on the intersections of native rights, treaty rights, human rights and civil rights. Um, there are tremendous concerns about reproductive freedoms, gender equality, queer trans equality, racial equality, disability rights, healthcare, the environment, voting rights, and various intersecting issues, basically everything. Um, lastly, grounding us here in Oklahoma, um, where at least three of the panelists um, are living, as well as myself, 
and then Glenda um, being Chickasaw Nation, definitely having deep Oklahoma ties, even if you're currently based in Arizona. Um, so um, lastly, grounding us here in Oklahoma and the recent international context of McGirt v. Oklahoma, could you reflect on the US Supreme Court decision and interwoven legal issues, such as the ongoing renewal of the intersectional provisions of the Violence Against Women Act, the Indian Child Welfare Act, American Indian Religious Freedom Act, Native American Graves, uh, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and Voting Rights Act, as well as the 2020 US Census and election. I know that's a lot, so feel free to take on any part of that. And I'm actually, for, for internal to our panel, I'm gonna paste the paragraphs in the chat that y'all see, that, but the public doesn't see. So that way you also see it, so you don't have to toggle back between more than um, one platform, like a Word file or something like that, or an email. So I'll have that in the chat. Um, so just recognizing that's a lot. So feel free to take on any part of that that you want and feel free to take on a part, have someone else share and then come back and to, you know, so we can just like flow with each other. Um, we've got two hours and there are other questions, but this is the biggest multi-part question of the evening. So don't feel rushed. Um, and so we can circle around to various threads and intersections as we organically flow and talk with each other. Um, where would you all like to begin when you think about this historical moment, each of you individually and all those intersections, feel free to each begin in a different place. You know, you could respond to what the person before you shared or start somewhere totally different and that's fine. Um, we want to hear what you yourself want to share. So um, whoever wants to start off and like I said, I'll paste the full question in the chat for y'all to see. And then, um, yeah. And then also I just got a message real quick um, just real quick, let me say, um, um, from Shawi Olali from Glenda S. Dillingham, um, that there was a tech issue and they're um, restarting their computer and will be back on. So they'll be joining us again. She'll be joining us again in a few minutes. So um, uh, Tanis Prento, who is staff at the American Community House, is helping us with tech things. So Tanis or myself will readmit uh, Shawi Olali as soon as their tech is back on. So um, yeah, so whoever wants to begin with the question, wherever you want to start with it, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we should do like rock, paper, scissors, who goes first. <laughs> but I will go, I'll be brave. Um, and mostly because I, you know, my view is kind of meta and comes back down anyway. So, um, you know, when I think about this, uh, the importance of this election, you know, um, we're in a we're in a time where people, indie country included, they're either heavily invested in either candidate or um, they're ambivalent to it altogether and they mistrust like what is going on, right? So, you know, Indian country spans that spectrum. Um, and so, you know, that already like really makes this a, a high stakes election. But, you know, I think what is happening in this moment is also um, has grown to be farther than the election, right? We're talking about a moment of um, deep um, racial angst, and, and divide, um, we're, we're, we're in this moment where, um, you know, hate crimes have increased, crimes against women, crimes against trans, like there's, there's all this violence that is happening um, and happening on, on, under the name of, um, you know, patriotism, you know, and being a patriot and trying to protect protect the constitution. Um, but what, what is really happening is a like grasping at power and grasping at a foothold for white supremacy. So from the vantage point that I stand at, um, what's at stake for Indian country is highly critical for this election. Whether or not we say uh, we, we you know, this is not our government, it's a colonial, a settler colonial government and it's their election. Regardless if we like don't participate in that, that's settler colonial 
government is making decisions that impact Indian people every single day. It impacts the land that we live on. It impacts the water. And we see from the McGirt decision that it impacts who makes decisions that impact our lives, right? So like the Supreme Court who, you know, who, who gets elected in this, in this, you know, election gets to decide who's in the Supreme Court and they get to decide who has a lifelong seat in that position. And there's been decades, centuries of decisions and not always to our best interests that continue to impact Indian people today and in, in terms of the Supreme Court. So the stakes are high, you know, the stakes are high right now. And, um, you know, for me, from, from the work that I do around like the environmental justice, native rights work, the McGirt decision, yes, like is, I'm not a legal person by any means. And when I, I saw, I was much like everyone else, I was like, Whoa, some, finally something to our favor. And funny story is like that week I was um, dealing with ceremonies. I was getting food and I was still dressed. I have my skirt on, my hair was braided, my earrings on. And people were like, so like just watching me. And I thought, oh, they're just mad because of McGirt. <laughs> the McGirt decision. Um, but no, my daughter reminded me, she was like, mom, you're like an extra indigenous walking around town getting groceries. And, <laughs> and I was like, all right, so be it. Um, but, you know, that decision didn't have just an impact on Indian country here in Oklahoma and the tribes in Creek Nation. Like it had, we're seeing now that all of the tribes are being implicated and not just, you know, what people say are the five quote unquote, civilized tribes, it's impacting others. And it has impact to other tribal nations nationally um, because it, 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 it sets that any changes that were made in treaty agreements around land have to be vetted by the constitution. And so the constitution, you know, was not written to include Indian people. And the matter of fact, when it was first written, it only included us as, you know, merciless Indian savages. But that constitution also today is supposed to protect us. So, you know, we have to know that thing both for its original intention and for its functional intention right now. And, you know, I think this election, um, the constitution is basically being voted for, in my humble opinion, anyway, you know, because some people are saying, well, we have to protect the constitution from the radical left. You know, basically in terms of my value systems, I would be considered that dangerous radical left, right? I believe people should have health care. I believe our water should be clean. I believe corporations should not be buying candidates. That's radical left. Um, and, you know, but there are others on the right who say, well, you know, we have to protect the constitution because they want to, you know, take away the second amendment. And I was like, well, what about the first amendment? <laughs> like it was first and then there's a second. But, you know, I, I think there are a lot of that is at stake right now. Um, in addition to all the like down ballot, like all those other candidates down ballot in, in Oklahoma are also making important decisions. They're making decisions about whether or not they're gonna, you know, work with tribes or not. And Right now, I feel like the tribes have an upper hand and I hope they maintain it. But even then, then the tribal elections become that more important because then those are the people who are making decisions on our behalf directly as indigenous people, native people and deciding whether or not they wanna, you know, um, compromise what we're trying to hold as indigenous people, whether that is land or sovereignty or water or our right to be, our right to pray, our right to speak our language. Um, so that's my two cents. Sorry that took a while. No, don't apologize. That's why we're here. We want that. Thank you. Whoever wants to go next. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I agree a lot with what you said, Benishi. Benishi, it's, I, I see the arguments on the other side of voting is a settler institution and that you're supporting this continued institution. But as you say, you're voting for policymakers and the people who are still ultimately changing 
and affecting life everywhere for everybody. So I, I agree, you really do have to get out and, and vote and get the right people in who are going to make at least better decisions than the ones that currently are for God's sake. But um, I think McGirt uh, was really interesting and it almost for people who, it Oklahoma is such a, a weird place. You know, we have 39 federally recognized tribes but if you drove through, if you're not from here and you drove through Oklahoma, I feel like so often you don't know unless you're seeing like, hi, welcome to Cherokee Nation. Hi, you're leaving Cherokee Nation. There's, there's no focus anymore on, on indigeneity and there's so many people who are here, why they're here. And so I think McGirt was a big kind of um, reminder for some people that, oh yeah, we're on Indian land, aren't we? What does that mean? Like it's been passed over so so much that we don't have, I mean, so many people don't have that conversation and there's been weird fear arising from it. Um, we, I had um, helped manage or create a, a talk recently for one of our latest exhibitions um, to talk about native sovereignty and land and treaty rights. And um, we had uh, Jonathan Chaturi and a bunch of other awesome people it was um, moderated by Mary Catherine Nagel and they, they talked about McGirt and the challenges that they're facing from it and how immediately after decision came down, there were, you know, oil lobbyists, the people going to Governor Stead and going to the president saying, can we reverse this? How can we change this? How can we get around this? And so it's going to be an ongoing battle, but it's been also, Creek Nation has been really great to say, this can only be beneficial. It only adds, gives us more control to do more, to, to add more services, to help more, to manage crime better with our people. And it's not, scary so calm down everybody but um yeah i i just please vote for god's sake <laughs> oh my gosh oh my god please vote <laughs> <laughs> some of us have all our audio turned off so you're not seeing this as those you're seeing one percent time speaking but we're doing finger snaps smiling head nods laughing so you might not be hearing that as viewers but we're not just like sitting like you know stone cold silent at like not emoting just we're trying to like you know not have ambient background sound but yes please please thank you so much jenny whoever wants to share next thank you so i um agree with uh, a lot of what both of you said you know we can't separate like um tribal government from the US government because of the treaties, it's so interrelated and not that voting is um, any of us, you know, get in love with the system, right? Um, but it's a tactic, it's part of a broader strategy in terms of that collective power we have amongst nations. And that's what um, I found interesting um, ahead of, the gaming compacts dispute, um, for those of you who are not aware, in Oklahoma, um, this year, 2020 was the year, or it, it has been the year for the tribal uh, gaming compacts between the state and the native nations or those gaming nations, um, whoever has a compact with the state to, to do gaming in their tribes, um, they were up uh, for renewal. And there was a dispute um, led by the governor of the state uh, in conflict um, with what the compact, how the compacts read. Um, the state can negotiate <laughs> and if the tribes don't like it, then it just remains what it, what it was. Um, before that occurred, I had been walk, um, talking to um, my own tribal community here, talking to leadership at that time, wondering um, back in 2017, like, Y'all know this is coming up, what are you gonna do? Do you have any ideas? Um, do we have representation at the state capitol? Um, Cause this is a more you know local issue, right? Like a more um, immediate issue, um, not necessarily something that happens at the federal level, which a lot of our people tend to think, you know, government to government is only federal, federal um, to nation. Um, sometimes we don't think about the state to, go, uh, to nation relationship. We don't think about the municipality or city to nation relationship. Um, so I think with, in my opinion, um, the conversations that I've had, um, especially with just like, you know, regular community people who really weren't thinking too much about politics at all, 
um, who didn't realize how much of their lives are affected by policy, uh, that uh, dispute by the governor really kind of started waking people up more and more to our, our local politics and how that has a huge um, factor in our in our everyday lives. Um, of course, with this uh, Supreme Court decision, I feel like more and more people are starting to pay attention to, to law, to the Supreme Court. Um, personally, I'm advocating for um, any justice who has a background in federal Indian law. Maybe not any, I don't know. Gorsuch has been all right for us, <laughs> although I wouldn't have preferred. Um, but yeah, if you're going to have people sitting on the highest courts in our, in our nation, in our states, um, they should have that background. It's a distinct kind of law that um, that you need that information. Otherwise, it's really people that don't know what they're you know what they're doing um, as they're making these rulings or who have limited knowledge as they're making these rulings that can impact us for generations. Um, so that's why uh, you know I, I I totally feel what y'all mean in terms of just trying to communicate that point to our people to our our, our community members and getting out the vote and why it's so important to um, to get out the vote. Um, I had another point, but i um, getting messages and they're distracting me, so um, I apologize, but um, I, I really am appreciating though that uh, even though it seems like it's taken people a, a lot longer than some of us to kind of wake up and realize what's going on, what is at stake, um, I heard this quote the other day from um, a podcast um, from a community leader in Miccosukee um, territory um, down in Miami. Miami. Um, and he was saying that in one of their uh, beliefs is conflict is a site of innovation. And so even though, you know, it's taken to this point of conflict for a lot of us to kind of be like, oh, that's what's really going on. Um, it's also an opportunity for us to be innovative, um, to to navigate in these ways that like our ancestors always had um, to adapt and create. And I feel like at this time, um, even with this um, pandemic, there are a lot of us that have um, become resourceful in ways we didn't think we we could be maybe, or we just didn't make the time to be. Um, and I think that can also happen in this in this election. Thank you so much, Jaisha. Yeah. I was enjoying listening to you. I kind of lost focus for a second. Uh, so with the election coming up, four years ago, I told people that if this person is elected, it's going to be okay to be racist again. And lo and behold, that's what's happening. It, it's coming to the point where, oh, why are we letting the Indians get this land? Well, guess what? It was ours to begin with. So the worst sides of the oppressor are coming out, but I also agree that the best sides of the Native and Black and Asian communities all the indigenous communities are coming out as well. Um, what I've noticed back in 2016 and now is a lot of the young people aren't educated about politics at all, um, especially the ones that are just turning 18. And so you really need to take time to sit down with them and tell them the facts. Um, I had a young woman the other day tell me she was going to Hobby Lobby. And I said, oh, really? And I had explained to her why that's not a good choice. Um, and then today she said she was going to check plays. Like, I'm not even going to touch that. We'll talk about it later. But, um, you know, people don't know the history, not even the recent history. Um, the Marines I work with, they don't realize that 15 years ago they couldn't be two spirit in, in the military that they you know could get kicked out so there's just a lot of lack of knowledge going around there and as far as the McGirt case and everything I you know I think it needs to happen 
I think it's sad that it happened because someone died. But um, I see hope in that. I see hope that we can have land reclamation. I don't have a reservation. I'm one of the few people I know who don't have a reservation. Um, and other tribes look at us funny because we don't. Well, we used to. You know, now I have a plot of land that's surrounded. No one's ever been on it because it's surrounded by a bunch of white ranchers in their land. So um, I think that's all I'll say for now. Pass it back to you, Ahimsa. Yeah, did any folk want to respond a bit more to anything that someone else said or that you were yeah, wanting I, to I, maybe come back to? Yeah. I just wanted to respond that like, I, I have one of those uh, children. I have three children, they're all adults. As of this year, my youngest turned 18 um, and he voted early. We voted early and um, I voted on Thursday and at my polling site, I was in line with 20 people and I was the fourth youngest person. And there were only three um, uh, people of color, and two of which were me and my partner. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's that's the demographic in much of rural Oklahoma, right? And and you know, so my son, he was um, excited for being the age that he was able to vote, and absolutely disgusted with his choices. I mean, for real, my son was like oh my God, I can finally vote and I don't want to vote for either one of them. And, and asked me if, if he had to choose someone. And so, you know, I had to, you, we had to talk about it. Like, no, technically you don't have to vote for a presidential candidate. Um, you can vote and but we talked about the importance of down the ballot, right? all these other folks are here in Oklahoma, they're important, so you really should vote. And he wanted to vote, but he just was really disgusted with his choices. And so I was like, you know, I, and I have to, you know, respect that as his own knowing and seeing and reading what's going on in the world and, and trying to respect his wishes. And I'm his mother and I'm also like, here's our values, son. And you have to think about like our values as a family and as a community. And um, so I don't know what he decided to do. We talked about his options of that, but um, that's a real sentiment with much of, you know, not just, and, and, and it's not that they're disinterested. I mean, he knew about the candidates enough to say, I'm not really excited about either one of them in terms of what they're doing for me and my generation and what, what I think they have in terms of opportunities. And we have to think about that, not just as a failing of their generation, because it's not, they're, they're tuned in. I mean, this is the generation that is plugged in 24 seven. I mean, they are literally plugged in <laughs> to the information superhighway 24 seven. So they know, I mean, these ads are coming in on their video games and then their, and their YouTube videos they are watching. These are the ads that are popping up. So they're watching it. Um, but it's a failing of our electoral system. And the, the, the failure of that electoral system is that it has whittled us down to a two party system. And a two party system is not a democracy. It's not. You can't just say that's, you know, vote for this side of the coin or that side of the coin. Like, it's not a democracy just because there's two choices. Yes, there's lots of candidates down a ballot, but the way that the system works is that he who has the most money wins the most votes. And so basically it's become, you know, and corporatocracy or whatever you want to call it. Like, it's like the corporations have bought they buy and sell elections all the way down the ballot, honestly, you know, all the way down through Oklahoma, buy and selling elections. And at some point, um, this country is gonna have to come to terms with that and and change it. And right now, if, if it works for folks, then they're not willing to change it. But there's starting to be a whole lot of folks who wanna see that change and wanna see it happen. 
and still we're going to go out and make sure people go vote and you know wanting to see a change and it's it's a conundrum that we're in as indian people all the time of both wanting to hold the federal government accountable to agreements they made with us as indigenous people as indian people and deconstructing and decolonizing that system that oppressed us those two things are in constant conflict all the time and as indian people and as activists engaged in like work and change where we sit with those conflicts all the time right McGirt decision is that and hey we shouldn't have to have the federal government to recognize us I'm still a people whether the federal government recognizes me or not I still have culture with language ceremony all of it but that's where we are right now and you know it's not enough for us to uh, a respected mentor uh former professor of mine told me the other day, it's not enough to examine the left wing or the right wing, you have to examine the bird. And I was like, damn, I have to sit with that for a while. <laughs> he said, if you're trying to like deconstruct the system, it's not enough to just look at the left or the white ring, wing. He said, so many people focus on that, they never examine the bird. And that's where we are, settler colonialism is the bird. That's really good. I, going back to, um, I know part of the question was talking about the Supreme Court. And I remember when Kavanaugh was put in the Supreme Court, I threw a fit. I was screaming and yelling at my TV so much so that my partner asked, um, do I need to call the medicine man? I mean, you, I was really out of it. And so I think a big part of surviving this and continuing our work is to take care of ourselves spiritually so that negativity doesn't hit us as much as the day. And I was a lot calmer this time um, with a new person, although I'm still very much grieving for RBG. Um, got a lot of compliments when I wore my RBG shirt yesterday, so I'm glad she's being recognized. But yeah, I think self-care and spiritual healing keep reminding us of what we're doing this for and being grounded is really important. Blessings, blessing. Um, anyone else can respond into either what people have shared or other parts of the question. Um, one thing that I'm thinking about that might be interesting as a topic is, and I'm gonna joke about it, but it's also totally serious, is like when I'm thinking about people and trying to get people motivated to vote or to engage any process, do you know what I'm saying? Because this isn't just the only area where there might be an enthusiasm gap and for a variety of completely valid reasons about choices people have. But there's many things where you're like, my goodness, are these the options I have in terms of majors? Or are these the options I have for eating right now? If they've like a lot of big corporations have bought out small businesses or are these the opposite options for buying books where there used to be more independent people of color and women's and queer trans owned bookstores or whatever it might be like, are these our options now? Like that's the larger question. And sometimes like we, I think have a lot of larger really important questions around do we work within a system if it's a you know colonial settler institution or other larger non-native or non-women's or non-queer trans specific or non-progressive specific kind of situation if it's not a people of color specific space like you know what are are we going to choose to work within that and try and transform it within are we going to try and work with outside of it are we going to try and create our own institutions further our own traditions? Um, are we going to try and work with people on the inside if we're out or work with people on the outside from the in or like all those different, like, like I remember Christos, uh, Two-Spirit Menomene sister saying very powerfully in the final piece to um, her book, uh, Firepower, that it's about finding the place where we belong and doing our work there, each of us. And for us, that might be different. Like I love doing arts organizing. I love it. I could do it endlessly. I do it way too endlessly and I'm exhausted right now, but I love creating dialogues. I love putting on a film festival. I love um, 
editing a journal issue. I love doing things that bring together people through the arts and through activism and stuff. I tried doing phone banking or like, you know, a voter registration, or I remember like doing, when we were trying to keep affirmative action in California back in the nineties, when it was up on the ballot and you're going there and talking on the street. And I was like, oh, I'm dying. Like, it was just not the work that fed me back, you know? And there's certain work that you can give in multiple ways in this world, but what gives back to you? Like, what is the work of social justice that gives back to you, that you feel sustained, that you feel nurtured, that you feel excited? So I guess it's actually becoming a two-parter sort of tie-in to this larger about the moment we're in is like, one is sort of like, what are the things that you're excited about maybe in terms of selection? It could be particular candidates or even if you're not excited about the person, but you're excited about what this means, like, or you might be scared and that's what you're excited. You know, you're like frightened and you're like, no, we have to win this, it's really important. And, I, and the reason why I bring that up is I like to, when I'm talking to people who are not enthusiastic about the US election as a whole is, there's probably something you can get excited about, you know? So if you're willing to engage in a system that is not perfect and that is subtler in a variety of ways and all these things, if you can make peace with that, or if we can try and convince you to like engage the process of voting, then there's probably gonna be someone who's running for PTA board at your local school. There's probably gonna be someone who is um, like, you know, Paulette Jordan's running in Idaho for the Senate. Do you know what I'm saying? We have Sharice Davids up in Kansas. We have Deb Holland, you know, down in Nuevo Mexico. There are other people running currently. There's like a Hawaiian brother running for the House of Representatives, Kai Kahele in Hawaii right now. Um, to represent for one of their uh, House of Representative seats in the US Congress. There's a variety of native candidates that are running right now. Not all of, and, the, and they're across the political spectrum. Um, so there's a variety of native candidates that you might get excited about at all different levels of races. Like there's um, different candidates who are running for state legislatures in a variety of places, including two spirit candidates, like queer trans native candidates that are running here in Oklahoma, um, that are running in Kansas, that are running across the country. So. Um, there's an organization called the LGBTQ Victory Fund, and that supports out queer candidates across political spectrums. So again, the LGBTQ, um, so just add a Q onto LGBT, LGBTQ Victory Fund, and there has a listing of all the, their candidates that are running. And so you can see if you were to look in and, and click under race, ethnicity, click native, you can see all the different native candidates who are running this year who are out and affiliated with the Victory Fund. So whether it's like supporting native women who are running, supporting queer trans native folk who are running, maybe it's a fighting a ballot initiative that you think is hateful or fight or fighting for one that you think is good, you know? So is there anything about this election that either you're obsessed with and you keep on clicking refresh on the numbers because you're following that race really closely or someone you're passionate about or, or similarly, is there some way that you've talked about this election that has made it hit home why voting is important? Well, I'm kind of like you, Himsa, in that um, I, I'm not a, I don't knock on doors or, or do phone banks. That's not my thing. I, I do work and live kind of in the arts world. And, and I also have um, an actor, a comedian, director kind of background. And so it's, it's the story, it's the narrative, it's that empathy when you show the lived stories of people. And then that that is what tugs at the empathy in others and gets them to think differently because I know every one of us on this panel have tried to have those conversations with family members or someone who disagrees with you and they just shut down. There's, it's like talking to a brick wall. There's no getting through, no matter how sane or whatever you are, it just, they've made up their mind and they're done. And so I, I get excited about creating um, places where we can can build those narratives. We have an exhibition that's open now um, of Shan Gosshorn's work. And she was a great activist, great human being, just a wonderful all around amazing person. And there's a great quote from her where she says, you know, she would try to have these conversations with people and she'd watch them just cross their arms and just shut down, but she'd make these baskets with these messages woven in that or made people curious and she'd watch them physically lean in to understand what is she talking about or what is this story I've never heard I didn't even know this happened and it's a really gentle way to approach a new narrative a new way of speaking to people 
in ways that they may not have been engaged before and gets them to think differently. And hopefully they carry that forward with them when it comes time for election and they've had this empathy that they've been exposed to. Um, I like creating those kind of moments, finding those, those intersectional spaces that you're not expecting it and then creep up and we get you. <laughs> Yeah, the Shan exhibition is really amazing. I went there with one of the other dialogue participants, Molly Murphy Adams, like about a week or two ago. And she was talking, Shan was talking, may she rest in peace, about how she'd been working on all these different artistic media. Um, and relatively recently in her life journey was really doing more work in basket making. And it was really interesting for her to see the different response she was getting to people, because she was still exploring the same issues that she'd been exploring. And I'm paraphrasing, please go to the exhibition and read up more on Shan's work, Shan Goshan. Um, is that that for her, like there, but she, she described in the exhibition in her own words, it describes how there was a lot of resistance to her work um, from audiences often a lot of times. And that for some reason, she felt that with the shift in media and doing, making baskets, the same messaging or the exploring of just intense issues and histories somehow shifted the like people's people were less resistant perhaps to the messaging because of there was something she even described as people were leaning in to look into the basket and so when there she has treaties weaven and woven into them or other things it actually there was something inviting about the shift in medium that actually like enabled conversations more. And she was very interested in that to have those political yeah. conversations through her art. So how long is that exhibition going up at the Gilcrease until? When is that open until um, roughly? So there's, there's two rotations. Um, the next rotation will open in the beginning of January and go through about the middle to end of March of next year. So there'll be a bunch of new baskets and new messages um, in the second rotation, be like a different exhibition. It's great, but but yeah, exactly. But, but it's currently open though, the exhibition it's is. currently open now, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But there'll be it's new opened. baskets in January. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, new baskets in January. But yeah, it's, it's like this basket is this beautiful thing that holds so many layers of things, physical things, memories, stories. I mean, they're books in and of themselves. And so it's this beautiful object but then it's that other message that she's literally woven in and in the skill of maintaining those imagery or those treaties and those, those words, those peoples, those names of people. And it really does, I mean, once you've, you've engaged empathy, that's when you engage memory. And so people will walk away with that emotional memory and then they carry that forward. Cause you could talk to somebody and if you're not hitting their empathy, they, they might not remember. So um, it's great, it's, it's great. Her work was, was just wonderful. She was fantastic, is fantastic. Anyone else for people on like either like something in terms of the election that has been enthused, uh, you've either had enthusiasm for a, a lack of a gap in that way of enthusiasm gap or things that you're really um, focused on or things that have you think activated certain people in different ways about the election? No pressure, we can also go to other topics, yeah. So I know I just, I was, I got, well, I just got inspired to share about um, Shan, you know, I, I grew up in a family of artists, right? And so um, Shan was very close and dear to my family. And um, yeah, you know, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a reminder how, um, you know, art and politic, are a lot are either aligned or one in the same, depending on your perspective, right? You know, I I was sharing um, in in preparing for this that you know I often thought of those things as very separate spaces until I was much older, and I was like, oh, my dad doesn't separate his politic with his art. He's always trying to say something that's important, and it's there. It's not just aesthetic. It's a it's a statement, and um, and so I, I, I. It took me a while to come to that space, and you know, I I, I listed myself as creative maker and not really like, oh, I'm an artist, right? But uh, you know, I write plays, 
I do theater, dance, like all of it. But when I was writing plays, I always thought I was going to write these comedies, right? And and I never wrote anything all that funny. And they were always these uh, tragic stories, um, but stories that were real, right? About domestic violence in, in Indian country, about um, you know the the human trafficking of of indigenous women you know and, and i realized that writing and writing plays and performing became a venue for me to continue my organizing work that i've done for 30 years right it was another way to express how can we have these conversations in indian country in a way that people are like oh i get it right and it doesn't have to be like oh you vote this way or you vote this way how do we have conversations about what we value as a community? Because I tell you, I, I live in rural Oklahoma and, and you know, when I talk to folks and even when I was voting the other day, you know, and I think, oh, all these people are gonna vote a certain way and like, but I had some conversations with people online and, you know, older people and some grumpy ones and some funny ones. But when you start talking about like, what do we value? What's important? And I will say there's so many times I talk to folks and they talk about, oh, you know where my grandpa used to live and we used to go fishing down there and that place is like so beautiful and I have such memories and, you know, and they want to protect and hold that place. That's an environmental value. They would never call themselves an environmentalist, right? We live in Oklahoma. That's a taboo word to say you're an environmentalist, right? <laughs> but it's that value system of like people value the land, they value like, you know, whether they want to call it recreation or tradition or whatever, you know, it's that relationship to land. And, um, but yeah, I, I, I think about the artists in my life who have used their talent to express those very things and those very values in ways that people can connect with in some place they start making these connections about what it is then those values being transmitted to not just elections, but to engaging in that process. Because the political process is not just tomorrow. It's not just been the season we are in. It, that's just one step of it. It continues when we make the point of talking to the city councilors, going to the county commission meeting, going to the corporation committee meeting, going and try to meet with your state legislator, that's also a continuation of the process, writing the letters to the editor, holding our elected officials accountable because no matter who you voted for, once they're there, they represent all of us. And we have to tell them, this is what we want. This is what we want protected and we make them hear it over and over again. And so, you know, that's, that's our task, that's our challenge. And why I think about like, yeah, I've been kind of a nerd about the voting stuff for a long time, but it was really fueled by, by a fight around protecting a sacred site, right? Like I've been doing environmental work for a while, but when I was in Albuquerque, it came like they wanted to build a six lane road through a, a sacred place through the Petroglyph National Monument. And that fight became about who was making the decisions, the mayor, the city council, and I took off work just to do that. Just I took off work to just work on like who's making those decisions and how can I change a city council of nine people, seven of them voting against my interests to shifting that to be six to three, the other direction on our side or a mayor that was voting with us. And that's how I got involved in it. But right now in Oklahoma and being home and being here and living and voting here, what, what guides me is my great grandmother, Alangwe. Alangwe, when she passed away, was 103. And my, my grandmother, she didn't speak English. She couldn't read or write. And she would go and sign her ex and she would vote. And my, my uncle told me this story and he always says, your grandma would say in the language, and I couldn't, I can't translate this to Yuchi for you. And she would say, I suffer no fools, right? My tiny bitty grandma, I suffer no fools. And she would yes. go and mark her ex and she would vote. And so I feel, I feel powerful when I think about her 
and voting. And I'll, I'll vote no matter whether or not I could care about the candidates or not. I'll go vote every time because my grandma went to vote and suffered no fools and signed her ex. Yeah, my, both my grandmothers um, couldn't, women didn't have the right to vote. Well, excuse me, my white grandmother didn't have a right, to, a right to vote until she was an adult. And it was several years again before my Indian grandmother did. So I always keep that in mind when I go to the poll that, you know, they fought for this, so I need to carry it on. Powerful. Did anyone else want to respond to either things that have um, been particularly in terms of the election or other life situations where you're like, well, this is what, you know, is exciting for me or how I get activated around this, or this is the thing that is my place, like Christo said, that this is the work that I do that not only I can do well, but it gives back to me and I get sustained through that work. Like, how have you found your place of where it's best for you to do the work that you do. Is that the work? And it might be the work you're currently doing for pay, but it could also be like, well, when I have time outside of that paid work, this is something that renews me, that is also building community, but it also gives back to me in a powerful way. I could add a little bit more to that. Um, I'm so, I feel, uh, I was definitely feeling, um, Benishi, you sharing about your um, your grandma. I have a visitor here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm certainly motivated by my family um, in a similar way. I think about a lot of the unnecessary struggles that um, my, my mother, uh, Jaboji, my grandma, um, kind of what they went through in their time and being witness to it. And then later being able to reflect, even though I was even asking some challenging questions that I know my, my mom probably thought like, what is with this kid talking to me like this? But <laughs> just wondering like, what, what is up? Um, but being able to reflect on it, not only as an adult, but as a, as a parent, and seeing the unnecessary struggle, the lack of resources and how that didn't just end in my house that like rippled out to the greater part of the community. And I think about like just this these lived experiences that I have that also other people have. Um, and something that I learned, especially when um, I, I am somebody who can put it on when I need to. Um, I don't mind uh, voter registrations. I don't mind door knocking or um, greeting people individually and having personal conversations. I really enjoy bringing people in. Um, if it's an opportunity that's there um, that they might not have otherwise, especially if I've had the privilege or the um, access, I want my, my community to have the same access and they can choose what to do with it as they will. You know, maybe it leads to other doors or other opportunities for them. And so um, I enjoyed uh, visiting with a variety of people just through the last couple of years of doing this very intentional um, um, electoral work and just hearing the same stories, hearing the same struggle. Although a lot of these people were kind of complacent or just didn't know like the questions that they, like they knew that something was not right or they weren't exactly settled with it. They just like, it was the questions that they, they couldn't quite like, it was like on the tip of their tongue of what they wanted to ask or, or even just the thought of questioning. Um, because yeah, here in Oklahoma, we're, we're, we're the Bible Belt. So a lot of our folks are kind of raised in a very um, like speak when spoken to kind of way. Um, it could be generational too. I see like my generation and younger are, are, are more apt to push back, but you still get um, those folks who are usually the voting block, the, the, the guaranteed voting block that really won't. And so it is, you know, having conversations, gentle conversations with folks who are of that uh, particular generation or of that, of that voting block and just kind of asking them, you know, um, 
you know, are you, are you happy? Or is it the kind of quality of life you expected? Or if you could have anything, what would you have? And just to, to let people have the opportunity to, to dream and to imagine is something that I've hoped for, for like all our folks. And so um, I definitely feel that like in thinking about like, well, who I come from and, and, and kind of the lives they led and the greatness that they still achieved, even with all that hardship um, is something that, um, yeah, I guess is kind of motivating um, in this, um, I guess in this work, like knowing that um, they did for me. So now I've got to do for others and um, knowing that there are, we have shared experiences that we can um, come together on uh, for the better. And, and that's, and now that's possible. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, so we're going to um, ask the next question. And we might just spend a little bit of time because we've already been spending a lot of time on a lot of the themes of this question. So and then the fourth question is a very different kind of question, but totally really don't want to save more time for that. Um, so the third question is, we are entering the final day of voting tomorrow. So much of the country has already voted in record turnouts despite ongoing and intensified voter suppression, voter intimidation, disinformation, harassment, and violence. And it's absolutely vital that people continue to get out the vote tonight into tomorrow and to mobilize every possible voter to the polls. What are your reflections on recent events tied to the election? And what kind of analysis can you offer us on the multiple ways we can continue to engage the electoral process tonight and tomorrow while also taking care of ourselves and our communities? Um, what should we be keeping in mind to make the best use of tonight and tomorrow? And what are ways we can take care of ourselves while still mobilizing? I, um... You know, you know, the, the news showed a lot of things happening across the country in a lot of states. And, um, you know, on one hand that, that, you know, provides me a lot of trepidation and anxiety and sadness and anger. And in another hand, it provides me with there's things to do and just got to like do it. <laughs> Right. Um, and so, and also that, you know, in terms of Indian country, um, no matter who wins, we still have a fight in front of us. I mean, on either, in either candidates, we still have stuff that we have to fight to protect for Indian communities. Um, and, and that's going to be true even more so going forward. I think, um, you know, I've definitely heard some, you know, disturbing reports about what possibly could be happening at the polls in terms of intimidation and and um, disenfranchisement. And um, and it's sad to say that none of those reports surprise me. Voter intimidation in, in Indian communities, indigenous communities, has been happening for as long as I've been a voter and. Parole was running when I first started voting. <laughs> so you guys can do the math on that. I'm not going to disclose my age, but, um, <laughs> but you know, that's been happening for a long time and we're just going to continue to push for it. I mean, hell, we couldn't even be citizens in this country unless we denounced our own tribal citizenship, right? That changed later. And then, you know, we became so-called citizens and still couldn't vote in a lot of states. And, you know, it took pushing in a lot of states to make that happen. So, you know, Indian people voting has not been a hundred years, right? <laughs> like it's not even been a hundred years that we could actually vote, vote. So um, I think that's still gonna be um, a reason why we should both engage in it and also balance it with, you know, what we're trying to build in our own home communities and what we're trying to protect and what we're trying to, to build, what we're trying to build up to be 
you know, whole healthy communities that can live our, our lifestyles that we want to live and we can have food available to us and, and the art and like our ceremony and all of that, like it can, that's what we're trying to build. So if, you know, this election tomorrow facilitates that, then so be it. Um, and we, we're, we're going to have to do that. I think in terms of protecting or to writing it out, the self-care um, is uh, drink lots of water. <laughs> water is life, water is medicine, drink lots of water. <laughs> um, and you got to cry some tears, water is still medicine, tears are still medicine. <laughs> um, but drink lots of water and, and, you know, don't dwell on what is uh, for me, I'm, I, I'm trying to balance not dwelling on like fear um, because fear is what is wanted and needed it, it, and needed for the for the those powerful who want to control things. That's what they want is to us to live in fear. And I'm not going to live in fear. You know, I'm not going to live in fear and I will, you know, do what I can to make sure our people are safe and 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 healthy. And if we have to like respond to protect our people in a much more physical way, then that call will be made and people will do what they need to do. Because right now we have so many systems, like Jason was saying earlier, like wherever it was that we had to be more resourceful in this time being, those networks exist. People had to flex that muscle of the care and keeping of community, right? We've had to flex that muscle in the last six or seven months. And if we have to flex that going forward, I think we have the infrastructure as Indian people to be able to do that and do that in a good way. And I have 100% faith in that. Um, and so if shifts and, and turns are going to happen, I'm here for it. And I'm, I'm going to make my contribution. And when I become an ancestor, my kids are going to say, my great grandma, she suffered no fools. I think along with water being medicine, art is medicine as well. And just creating and putting all of your emotions into your artwork. And just, I'm putting my, I have my feathers out for some reason and, and the cat's in the room. So I'm trying to make it a little safer. But yeah, I think that's where a lot of our strength lies into what we put out there in the universe in a creative way. Anyone else want to reply to that? Yeah. I've been um, checking in with people throughout the day and asking them, how are they doing, you know, the night before the election? And almost every single person it's striking to me has said, I'm avoiding the news today. I can't, I'm just, I'm not looking at anything. I just, I will, I will check in tomorrow, but I can't today because it's been a long four years. I mean, it's been a long many years, but I just, there's a lot of exhaustion and just sadness and apathy. I think a lot of people, I've met a lot of people who are just apathetic since the last election. They're still sort of shocked on a daily basis and they're, it's like a protection mode. I mean, sometimes I feel that too, but um, I think there's just so much, it feels like trauma, you know, it's like, a, it's a traumatic response of people just mm -hmm. shutting down for just a minute and blocking it out and just living. And I think that's okay too, on the night before this election, but um, hopefully you hope that we'll have voted by then, or you plan on voting because you're going to vote, right? Not only did I vote, but every day I've checked the voter registration to make sure my ballot was received and counted. Because <laughs> you never know. Anything else? Uh, thoughts on either mobilizing tonight or tomorrow or how to take care of ourselves during tonight and tomorrow? I think in terms of just simple mobilizing, if you're if that's where you're at um, at this point you know, uh, I like 
how everybody has mentioned checking in on your relatives, gently remind them to vote <laughs> as you're checking in on them. Um, I know some of our relatives here in the state still don't have power um, because we had some very rare ice storms um, at the tail end of October, which is not just some weird Oklahoma weather, that's climate change. <laughs> so if you didn't like no power, if you didn't like that um, you didn't have heat, um, trees crashing through you know, your yard or your house or your driveway or vehicle, like, you know, it's important to pay attention to what needs to be done once that um, something like that happens. But yeah, um, I think just sending, you know, small messages, but then in terms of just like uh, the, the care, or what we need to be doing to take care of ourselves, I think just to be honest about your boundaries, boundaries are, are, are healthy. So if you have done everything you feel you, you could do up to this point, then rest, <laughs> take rest, sleep, um, your body probably needs it if you oversleep, you know, I think that's, that's, you know, our bodies are telling us, you know, what we need um, to do. And a lot of times, I think, especially as femmes or, we, or women, we kind of don't listen all the time, because we're kind of socialized to just go, 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 or ignore some of that um, internal, internal messaging. Um, I know I will go to sleep, and I will sleep and wake up and get back to it um, in the morning. But um, I have um, plans post-election. Like, you know, that's also part of it, too. I know I've seen some some folks mention safety plans um, post-election. I also think um, if there's something um, relaxing or fun that's not dealing with this, you know, election or the political um, the next day, uh, to make that plan as well if you haven't already. Um, I'll throw in a Shan story. Um, so I became close with Shan, um, I think back in 2013 when she sent out the all call for the Vava basket. Um, she included me in my, my middle. Um, she was our youngest at the time. And uh, that struck up um, conversations and a friendship, um, a sisterhood. And I hold her, you know, right here. <laughs> I'm gonna choke up a bit, but. When I um, ran um, for office in 2018, uh, you know, I knew I did all I could do um, with the time and resources and the support that I had. So the election was going to be what it was, uh, whether win or lose. I knew the next day I was going to see her and Tom and be with them. And I think their daughter was there uh, the next day too, um, their youngest. And so, uh, that was the plan regardless, win or lose. And it really helped me because um, I didn't win. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of a long shot, but um, I wasn't crushed. I wasn't devastated. It, it could have been expected, but you know, we really felt like we were gonna get a win. I know my opponent was really shook <laughs> and worried going into that, um, that Tuesday, two years ago. Um, but yeah, I was looking forward to the next day. Like I was going to get up and I was going to go see my friend, my sister, my family, and we were just going to hang out and just chill. So I think that's something too, that um, if you're able to uh, schedule that chill time, um, if you're not able to right now, you know, immediately the next day. So that's my, my advice, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you know, what? I was, I wanted to share what, you know, Jason reminded me of is um, run for office. Like even if it is a long shot, because you know what happens when Indian people run for office in races that, you know, that is, is that it does exactly what she says. It shakes them up. One, <clears throat> and then two, they have to respond to our issues because we're the opposite voice asking those questions and bringing up those issues. My sister-in-law ran for mayor of Rapid City. <laughs> like, Indian kind of like, this is like one of the most like twisted cities in, in terms of its relationship with Indian people. And she ran anyway. And, you know, but she got to be part of the debate and, and you know, part of the community debates that were happening and asking the hard questions. And in any races, win or lose, you still affect what people are thinking and you affect how the, the structure is set up to like facilitate corporate 
power and corporate, like, I mean, the whole thing is set up as a corporate structure. And so whenever we engage in it, we leave our indigenous influence there spirit all of it and it makes them have to respond and have to like engage in a different way so run for office even if you think you're not gonna have a chance to win run because then they have to respond to indian country and i I think that's a good thing at least (laughs) here's my button another voting indian this is an old ass button this is from like 98 maybe or 99 (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> another voting Indian right here. <laughs> I've got to show <laughs> my um, boyfriend lent me his t-shirt that said fighting, fighting fascism. fascism. <laughs> it's 1942. So. You got to do it, you know. We were both like living it and deconstructing it at the same time. And that's just our reality for our generation anyway. And, but, you know, I I think, you know, what I was saying, I was saying to to our panel earlier is that our greatest act of decolonization is just be Indian, right? I get to Mm -hmm. just being Yuchi, they try to wipe us out and we're still here. This panel has had two Yuchi people on it and it's series and that's like unheard of. <laughs> it, <laughs> like, to have two Yuchi, well, that was the other panel yesterday or what, Friday? But, you know, and Anishinaabe, my mother's Anishinaabe and, you know, to just be and then go into a polling place and vote where n- nobody hardly looks like me, but I was an Indian voting and people noticed me and they saw me in line and they saw me wait and they saw me cast my vote. And that means something. If that scared some people, so be it. If that made some people happy, love them too. (laughs) But, you know, I went in as an Indian person and went to go vote. And I think that's what we all have to do is show up and be Indian and vote in that system because this constitution right didn't intend to include us but it does now and so use it or lose it blessings and yeah um one of thank you all so much um earlier today um so a real quick backstory i'll make it very brief so a year ago roughly when i was hanging out with like um uh, dear friends of mine, both Anita Fields, who's Osage, Emma Skokie, another artist, Tulsa Artist Fellow, and then Lydia Cheshawala, another artist and organizer who was on the panel on Friday night. And Anita has been involved with Osage tribal elections for years and was talking about the various things that they tried to do to ensure um, electoral integrity with their process and their ballots. And from that discussion, then talking with Lydia and stuff, we were talking about, this is in 2019, about 2020, and how to indigenize different aspects of the voting process. And um, uh, not saying voting isn't already indigenous in a variety of ways and tribal communities and other things, but more, could there be like little cute things we do that are, oh, I remember when Z Light had a song, vote baby vote, are you registered baby? Back in a previous decade, I shall not name which, but that was like a little song by this little music group. And it was like viral on M- when there was an MTV, you know, and it was like this thing. And it was like, oh, everyone's creating like celebrities creating things. And, and people are doing that now too. They're creating little videos. They're creating little TikTokeries and stuff like that and tweeting things. And, and not just celebrities, but everyday people are creating cool things, you know. And all those social media things actually do motivate people. They do help people stay in line. Like if you're standing in line for two hours or you just dealt with someone racist or misogynist or queerphobic while trying to vote and you're just like, I'm gonna watch my Sarah Cooper videos right now imitating Trump, okay? I'm gonna watch those right now, this fabulous African Jamaican sister. And I'm just gonna watch all of them again on audio because you're trying to get in my face. So like whatever it is that we need to do they both help get people to the polls and stay in the polls, you know, because sometimes people also do little pizza runs or other things to like make sure people have food and water when they're standing in line. Um, so one of the things I would say is, you know, perhaps consider sharing these videos. A lot of people 
may need to have some love and attention and care and pierce that isolation during this process. And this conversation tonight as well as the one on Friday have been, I think, really powerful and beautiful. And there's also like things that look like what I was saying about indigenizing parts of the voting process. So in addition to those PSAs, I was saying, you know, those little voting stickers, each state often has their own version of it or sometimes a county does. So I saw a little peach for Georgia, a Georgia peach little voting thing. And I was saying, well, maybe instead of those stickers or in addition to them, maybe we could bead something. Maybe we could bead something and you know, maybe that's the little beaded thing that we bring out each time we go vote, not just every four years, but during the midterms, during the mayoral and total elections and the primaries and stuff. And so we were talking about that, me and Anita and Lydia, they liked the idea. And then, you know, you get busy with other organizing. And so today with all my spare time on four hours sleep, I was like, Molly, Molly Murphy Adams, who's the Glaw Lakota descendant, you know, who's in studios right next to mine in the Tulsa Arts Fellowship. I was like, can we beat something really quick? And can I show it? And can we do a video and stuff? So we did, or she did, because I also had to do other organizing at the same time. So this is one of the things Molly made. Um, beautiful beadwork. And we created, um, and it's on Pelon. And this could be just a badge that could be pinned to your shirt. Um, she also did another one, a rainbow one, very nice and two-spirit friendly um, and social justice friendly. And that one was um, fully made into a pin and there was like edging around it. And she also then, uh, because Molly is brilliant, she, and, and a bead worker in addition to everything else. So she did a full design of it on graph paper. So people would know how many beads across and how many up and the inches and stuff. So within that, um, uh, whatchamacallit, um, she has some documentation of our little conversation or her designs um on her uh instagram molly murphy adams and then we're gonna hopefully share some stuff maybe also through american community House, i don't know and but we had a 13 minute video of the process of creating it and this and that and and also if you did it like horizontal could you do things could you put another rose on the side for like tribal design if you wanted to tribalize it in a particular way so this is something you could have and that's a particular thing that you could then take a photo of and that might like create like a little more social media buzz to get people to the polls, you know? So these are little things that we can do that give us a little piece to create beautiful that indigenize it. So yeah, just an idea. I'm just gonna plug Molly again. These are her, her earrings that I'm wearing tonight. Love you, girl. <laughs> cool. So if people are cool with it, we'll move on to the last question. And um, let me just copy and paste it and then I'll read it. Um, so this is the final question for the night. Um, these are incredibly challenging times and this is an incredibly challenging week and year. What are resources within yourself, your communities and the larger world that have sustained, grounded and renewed you? In addition, oftentimes Native womanists and two-spirit queer trans Native peoples, as well as women of color and queer trans people of color more broadly, often do disproportionate amounts of communal care involving emotional, mental, spiritual, and physical labor, mentoring, taking care of our loved ones, being focused on others' well-being. How do we caretake the caretakers? How can we shift and share the labor of looking out and loving each other and create more gender and sexuality, equitable, sustainable models of leadership? so that the caretaking of our communities is done by all of us, you know? So just sort of like, yeah, to think on that. Um, for me, for the first part is humor, just sharing funny moments and memes and stories and jokes throughout the day every now and then. Um, that I've seen an uptick in, in attempting to make each other laugh with my friends and relatives more. I think uh, humor is extremely important. Get through a lot with humor. I would say um, I'm I'm a hundred percent behind the humor. Like that's a that's a highly valuable commodity in our household and. Um, and 
you know, we hold bragging rights around who's more funny and in, in our and my whole family, right? That's been a thing. But so, and I think that's what has helped us survive as a people. You know, I always uh, curious about how we came to have this um, stereotype of being this like stoic Indian. Um, Cause if you really knew Indians, you would know we're hella funny people, <laughs> but <laughs> so, um, so there's that, um, but also I, I think we have to ask for what we need and, and, and own as, you know, a, a femme identified person. Like I have to own what I need and not be afraid and not be afraid of judgment that, oh, I'm, I'm being weak if I ask for what I need. So two things that I've asked for in the last few days mm -hmm. is from my team, um, that I work with, you know, I told them, I was like, listen, when I have a lot of anxiety and, and I'm tired and I feel this kind of angst, I can sometimes be really bossy and mean. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's not exclusively a mama trait, but, it, you know, sometimes I get really bossy and mean. So I, I told my folks, I, I would, I just ask for a little grace and understanding, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time that I might be a little crunchy. <laughs> And, and I asked um, my, my family, I live with my son and my partner and my honey, hella funny dude. We all ever knew, knew no Tushka Aloha, he's hella funny and um, keeps me laughing. Um, but, you know, I told them, y'all need to cook, somebody's cooking. So, you know, we take turns cooking in this house, but I told them this week, especially, um, I'm going to be really busy and doing long days, long calls and, um, and they do, they both come in here, my son and my partner, and they come, you need water? Did you eat something? And because I sometimes am stuck here in front of this Zoom thing for a long time. <laughs> goofy kiddos, hugs from goofy kiddos. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's awesome. Lots of hugs, dude. Hugs is on the list. I forgot. Hugs is on the list. And sometimes I cry in a hug. I just like, I just need to cry for like three minutes and then I get a hug and then I'm like, all right, back to work. I think power naps are awesome. I had a good 20 minute one before we went live today. So, and humor. Um, so you mentioned um, the tr woman who plays Trump. Uh, Drag Race Britain has the funniest impersonation of Trump that I've ever seen. If you look it up, it's hysterical. And it's even more funny that, oh, this is what other people think of us in the United States. Yeah, I've been watching certain clips on replay, like Sarah Cooper, African Jamaican um, American uh, comedian. Um, like that has been just, um, yeah, like really wonderful, like seeing her clips, like it's enabled me to hear the voice of the person that she's imitating, but to see her expressions and this performative taking a part of this rhetoric um, and this word salading that is often, what we're having to deal with in terms of leadership. Um, so that's been powerful. And then also like just watching Kamala dancing compilation video that has brought me joy. And then I don't know who, I've shared it with like dozens of people, but Lizzo's Halloween costume video on Instagram, which she was imitating being the fly on Mike Pence's head. That is gold. <laughs> if you have not seen her twerking in a fly outfit, you know, pretending that she's the fly on like Mike Pence's head. And then there's another clip that was actually Rachel Maddow interviewing Kamala Harris and being like, Kamala, did you see the fly? And I just saw like, you know, Kamala is trying to be so presidential. Oh and she's like, and you could almost see her face like, oh, Rachel, please don't cost me the election by asking me that question. But she chose to respond. But you can almost see that her face like, and then she's like, she just shook her head like, yes, I did, you know, and just so like these little things where we get to um, have humor is really important. And 
And for me also ha having supportive friends, gathering with y'all, these dialogues are sustaining me, you know? Gathering together with native women and queer trans native folk, that actually does, I feel like, and talking and centering folk does actually shift some of that labor in different ways. And at least naming that this is a lot of labor that people often assume that we, we will do, that different oppressed peoples will do on behalf of taking care of communities and be like, well, yeah, well, what about us? Can we take care of ourselves too while we're trying to be there for community? I have to say too, I had an experience recently with a young survivor who first told me or told anyone about her assault about a month ago. And in that time, she's gone from victim to survivor so fast. And she's 17 years old and she's coming in talking about toxic masculinity and why is this happening and why do men think they can do that? And what I had offered is like, that kind of thing trickles down. Look at where this is coming from. That whole attitude is being accepting of sexual abuse and degrading women. So, and I saw her mother's eyes light up and it clicked. And of course, then young mother's Republican and not aware of these things, but getting that message across to people has really helped me. Anyone else who wanted to respond to that, either about, you know, self-care or like taking care of, you know, Native women and prioritizing Native women and two spirits in terms of the work that's going on? I hope you can hear me. We have a meltdown in the background. I can um, hear you, yeah. Okay. Uh, so some other parts of my work I forgot to include. Um, I think, um, or it was mentioned that I am a lactivist, meaning that I um, promote um, lactation. <laughs> if you're able to lactate for your, your child, your baby, um, for native lactation especially. Uh, and so I am part of a collective um, um, called Native Breastfeeding Week. Um, I initially founded it um, and worked with some of my friends across uh, Turtle Island um, in the various areas of the land that's now called the United States um, a year ago. And some uh, in this second year um, for this week, um, for those of y'all don't know, that it, it's kind of, we're like a really small group in terms of kind of this social justice work. Um, there are a lot of folks that, that um, promote breastfeeding or chest feeding, but in like, you know, the broader scope of racial injustice or kind of like a pocket um, and so I have found myself um, in this community, um, within this committee, like uh, we were able to hold, and we're, like I said, we're, we're across the, we're across time zones. So we, when we were putting on our week um, a year ago, it was all virtual. And then, so going into the second year, it didn't really change too much, even though, you know, it's a pandemic, it was just um, okay, so we've done this before. How do we do it again? But how do we talk to um, this time and how do we um, make it relevant um, and speak to uh, or speak with community? Um, and so we had these virtual circles like this um, throughout the week that really was a lot of medicine, a lot of a lot of light in our lives um, and in um, our community. Um, they shared out, you know, that there was conversations that we were having that they hadn't really ever had um, publicly. Um, a lot of non-Native folks that were there participating as well, that were truly taking in a lot of information. And just from that time, it really solidified to me this medicine work that I'm taking part in that I didn't really, I just thought it was advocacy, right? I just thought I was just like somebody who was just wanting visibility and representation. And I knew people who were also that same way. And so like, what can we do together to, to raise up this issue, um, to try and find solutions, to um, get our, ourselves at the table of, of these policy uh, makers, um, organizations, uh, especially if they claim to be supportive of the whole spectrum of folks who are um, 
breast or chest feeding. And so um, in, in that just convening, it was a lot of light for me. Uh, again, uh, an affirmation of this work I, um, that I do as a two-spirit person. And it was uh, laughs, it was tears. Um, we were holding space for one another because sometimes in in this in our particular work there are a lot of gatekeepers um, across you know like native non native and so we have um, experienced similar uh, barriers and um, we're also felt really fortified together um, and that was something that um, this year that uh, has kind of shown a light on my path as I move forward um, going into the next couple months um, and knowing that this pandemic is not ending anytime soon um, and knowing that there is a community need so how you know uh, how do we go forward I won't go forward alone it'll definitely be with my relatives from that circle and we've also um, you know engaged with other relatives like this the circle continues to get bigger so that was something that um, I found uh, in terms of, um, yeah, navigating this caretaking. Thank you, Jason. Anyone else on that? Well, then I think, um, yeah, I'd like to see if people have, um, yeah, any like final comments they'd like to share. We're gonna like also have, um, uh, maybe like some uh, staff from AICH, maybe just say a few quick things about some additional programming coming up. But were there, yeah, additional things either to the panelists or to your communities that you'd sort of like to share before we wrap up for the night? I would, I would just want to say that like we've, we've talked a lot about Oklahoma and tribes here and about Indian people in general. Um, but we're not in this. We're not in this struggle alone. You know, there are lots of other people um, that are impacted by what's happening here in in the U.S. You know, lots of indigenous peoples in other countries are impacted by what happens with this election, and and so I just you know, it feels stronger to know that like it's not just us as Indian people or it's not just us as Indian people in Oklahoma, but there's other Indian people and, but also other people who are, you know, standing up for what they think is right and, you know, are in it with us. So that feels stronger anyway. And it's been an honor to be here with you. Thank you. I think regardless of the election, how it, shakes out there's been so much um movement and fire i think around so many different forms of visibility and people just being fed up and making it visible um i think that that will need to be carried for either forward either way but there's been so much community coming together so i think that we still have that momentum and we just need to maintain it regardless of the of who who's elected. And I think that we're on a good path to do that. And having groups like these that you can talk to and go to are, are really important. So um, thank you for organizing this and inviting me. And I'm so glad to have gotten to meet all of you or to meet all of you. So uh, I hope we can stay in touch too. This has been, been a really great conversation. Anyone else wanna have closing thoughts? No pressure. I just really appreciate all of you and I'm so glad that you're out there doing the things that you're doing and it's an honor speaking with you. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanna express gratitude um, similarly, like again, Mado for this arrangement, um, shout out to, uh, to the sponsors um, for this event and holding space for us to, um, yeah, just pick our brains, but not in a good, or not in a bad way, in a good way. And um, look forward to visiting with y'all um, later on, Mado. I just wanna say like, it's been an honor being with each of you. I'll share a little more in a second after I invite um, Tanis to speak. So um, thank you again so much for joining us. Tanis Parento 
our AICH staff member has been helping tonight with all tech issues behind the scene. Tanis, would you like to share a bit about AICH ongoing and upcoming programming? After that, I'll close out by sharing about the third and final dialogue of the series occurring later this week after the election. Yes, thank you, hi, hi. Thank you to the panel for this evening. It was very, very powerful. Um, we have some upcoming events this week. Um, Wednesday, we have Fit Native class. Fit Native class this week is going to be Wednesday and Friday um, at noon, noon on Wednesday, and I think 11 or 1 on Friday. I have to look at my <laughs> calendar because I'm juggling meetings in between. Um, but I will let my email list know. If you want to get on the email list for that, um, just email me, tanis at aich.org, or just shoot us a DM and we'll get back to you. Um, you can always just watch on Facebook Live too and participate that way, but I will make an event on Facebook and share that as well so you know exactly what day and time those two classes are going to be. And then on Thursday, we have Native Theatre Thursdays are back this month. Um, our first play is going to be this Thursday at 8 o'clock p.m. It's called Bingo Hall by Dylan Cheeto and it is directed by Tara Moses. Um, it's a really fun play. It's a really, really great play and a great play for this November being Native American Heritage Month and everything else that's going along in this month. So that's at 8 p.m. live streamed on our Facebook. Um, and then on Sundays throughout the month of November, we just got started um, this Sunday, this last Sunday is our Native Youth Drama Acting Series program. So what we're doing is holding some free classes for Native youth between the ages of eight and 20 to um, come and learn a little bit about the acting business and, and the craft of acting and um, some writing and some, some drama, some arts, just uh, get everyone connected and, and see what everyone's interested in and um, work that little acting muscle a little bit. <laughs> so that is every Sunday in November. We did our first one was just an orientation. So if, um, there's still room for people to join and it's free. It's at 3 p.m. Eastern time on Sunday. Um, so if you want to, if you have any youth that would like to participate in that, again, you can shoot me an email, tanis at AICH.org or shoot us a direct message on social media. We will see it and get back to you. Um, so that's every Sunday this month and it culminates with all the youth participating in short plays that are being currently written for these youth to um, act in um, with professional playwrights, professional native playwrights, native directors, all native actors, a native stage manager. It's really, really exciting. We're really, we're really happy that we can um, carve out this time and have some native youth in our programming. So um, that's it for now. Um, and you have an event coming up on Saturday that I'll let you talk about. Thanks, Ahimsa. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, there's always great things happening at American Community House and especially during the Community House doesn't just serve New York City, it serves the Northeast. Um, and across, you know, a lot of our tribal communities go across the colonial US Canadian border. And so um, the Community House is definitely, especially during this pandemic time, reaching out to people throughout not only the Northeast, um, but like throughout Turtle Island. And so, for example, the program that Tanis mentioned is virtual. So if you know of like Native youth ages, eight to 20 who might be interested in the performing arts, they could be anywhere. And supposedly from what I've heard, the first event that was a Sunday um, did have the full age range from someone eight years old to 20 years old and from all over. So um, feel free to like check out our programming. We've done a lot of two-spirit programming. We've done a lot of women's programming, a lot of things around health, multiple forms of art, environmental issues, social justice, elders. We really try to be a space for uh, very intersectionally thinking about larger native communities. Um, so please continue to connect with us. And if you haven't, click um, follow on our Facebook page and they'll like be more kept in um, the loop on different things, including when the next event, the next dialogue goes live on Saturday. So speaking of which, let me tell you about that, the third and final dialogue. Um, our third and final dialogue will be occurring after the election this coming Saturday, November 7th. It will be 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern. So it'll be a different time because it'll be the weekend. 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern, which is also 1 to 3 p.m. Central. Our panelists will be Vince Christosimo, who's Chamorro, 
and is a Pacific Islander, elders, HIV AIDS, and LGBTQ community organizer and educator. We'll also have Kristen Gentry, who is Choctaw Nation, a bisexual Native woman, artist, writer, and curator. We'll also have Alison Herrera, who's Zolan Salinan, uh, who's a radio co, uh, co sorry, I, I want to read it both ways at the same time. She's uh, Alison Herrera, Zolan Salinan is a radio and print journalist, and the radio station that she works with is KOSU, which I believe is pronounced locally KOSU, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, any local Native folk, did I say that wrong or right? Um, do people say it's KOSU just, or just KOSU? No. Yeah. Okay, just, <laughs> just like, <KOSU>. okay. <laughs> no, I'm still learning, like I'm still been here. So yeah, yeah, sometimes you just read things a million times and you've never heard someone say it. So thank you. So KOSU is the radio station that Allison works with in addition to being a print journalist. We'll also be having Beverly Little Fun. Oh, funny thing. I kept on saying Aniak rather than One Oak because I didn't understand that that was the pronunciation. I was like, yes, let's go to the Aniak, you know? And I was like, so there's little things. That, and then when I heard it, I was like, oh, education, Oklahoma. They think that's how you spell One Oak. So it was a little like local, non-local joke, you know? So anyways, we're good. Um, so I was mentioning about Beverly Little Thunder, who's one of our other panelists. See, humor is powerful. Beverly Little Thunder is Standing Rock Lakota Nation uh, and is a two-spirit activist and organizer, writer, and educator. We'll also have uh, D.K. Ali'i McKenzie, who's Kanaka Maoli, is an indigenous librarian trained poet and proponent of queer well-being. And we'll also have Joseph, uh, Joseph, sorry, let me slow down, Joseph M. Pierce, who is Cherokee Nation, a writer, scholar, and curator and also on the board of the American Indian Community House. Um, we wanna thank everyone for coming tonight. Please continue to share about the dialogue series and to share the video recordings of the first dialogue, which is again on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram on, for the American Community House. This dialogue will also be getting released on our social media platforms later tonight or tomorrow. So please feel, feel free to check that out and share those. Um, and as you continue to mobilize for the election, we hope these dialogues will provide important reflections and motivations for our communities to engage this historic moment. We look forward to gathering with you on Saturday when our panelists will be sharing their analysis of where we are post election day and how to continue building from there. Thank you all and have a blessed night and continue to get out the vote. Peace.